David, a recital partner. And their work together on a recorded cycle of Beethoven violin sonatas was an undoubted factor in winning that award. Gramophone called it life-enhancing, and I can only agree. Tonight, though, it's not Beethoven, but two later figures whose lives were potently connected and are the subjects of a series of concerts and is his curating here at Wigmore Hall this season, Schumann and Brahms. They met momentously in 1853, when the young Brahms, just 20 and a blonde, blue-eyed Adonis, turned up on Schumann's doorstep in the hope the older composer would take an interest in him. And Schumann did. It's fair to say he was smitten, in a manic way that foretold the mental instability that would bring his life to a tragic end. He instantly declared Brahms a genius, a gift from God. Within weeks they were working together on a collaborative violin sonata. Two movements written by Schumann, one by Brahms, and one by Schumann's pupil Albert Dietrich. It was meant as a gift for the violinist Josef Joachim, and each movement features the notes F-A-E, in tribute to a motto Joachim adopted for himself, Frei aber einsam, free but lonely, a slightly mawkish advertisement for his bachelor status. The piece wasn't played in public, and it's never been played much since, except for Brahms's contribution, a galloping scherzo full of youthful, testosterone-driven passion. It has standalone status, and here to play that scherzo from the FAE Sonata are James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong.
James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong there playing the scherzo that Brahms contributed to the FAE Sonata, written in collaboration with Schumann and Schumann's pupil. I said it was a gift for Joachim. It was actually a surprise gift. Joachim had to guess who had written which movement. And apparently he had no difficulty because the driven energy of Brahms's scherzo stood out as extraordinary. In fact, it towered over the other movements to a degree that they didn't really gel together. And perhaps that explains why Schumann extracted the two movements he had composed and recycled them into his own third violin sonata, which we hear next. He did this almost immediately in the autumn of 1853. And it turned out to be his last surviving work of substance because early next year he had a mental breakdown and ended up in an asylum. The sonata wasn't published because Clara Schumann thought the writing was already compromised by her husband's insanity. And that remained the received wisdom on the piece for many years, so it's not well known. But there have been recent champions, like Stephen Isselis, who decided that as violinists don't play it, he'd adapt the music for cello. And in fact, he's recorded it. Though Ennis hasn't recorded it, his view is that the sonata is entirely viable, and I think he's going to say something about that before he plays it. It's certainly a piece of extreme contrasts and eccentric humour. There's a crazy fugue in the fourth movement. And it's not hard to hear a valedictory quality in the writing, as if Schumann knew this was the end. But, of course, that can only be speculation. Here to make the case for the virtues of Schumann's third violin sonata are James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong. May I just say, it is such a, such a joy and such a pleasure for us to be back in this uniquely beautiful room. It has been greatly missed. And I know I can speak on behalf of Andy, myself, so many other musicians, but I'm guessing I can speak on behalf of all of you as well in giving a huge thanks to the Wigmore Hall for all they did to keep the music alive over the last couple of years. It was so inspiring to see, and uh, I just, I tip my caps to the Wigmore Hall team for all they did, so thank you. I was planning on saying a few words about the unique connection between these two pieces on the first half, and then shortly before I went on stage, I saw the very excellent program notes and realized that they said everything that I was going to say. <laughs> and then when we were backstage, I heard the, um, the radio producer talking to our online audience and saying all the things that I'm about to say too. So you're really going to get these into your head. These are important facts. <laughs> there will be a test at the end. Um, but it, it really, to me, is a fascinating connection between these two pieces, and really the connection between Brahms and Schumann in general. Uh, in 1853, a very young, 20-year-old Johannes Brahms showed up in Dusseldorf at the home of Clara and Robert Schumann, apparently with a suitcase full of music and a letter of introduction from the great Hungarian violinist Joseph Joachim, whose name will figure prominently uh, in this discussion, and really he was a figure that uh, figured prominently throughout their lives and their legacies. Uh, the Schumanns were immediately taken with the young Brahms, proclaimed him a genius. Uh, Brahms moved in sh just down the street, and uh, within a couple of months, uh, Joseph Joachim was coming to town, and Robert Schumann had an idea that they should write a piece for Joseph Joachim. He enlisted his student, Albert Dietrich, and the young Brahms, and said, let's write a piece for Joseph Joachim. We'll each write parts of it, and then he'll have to guess who wrote what. <laughs> so the movement that you just heard was Brahms's contribution to this sonata, which has become known as the FAE sonata, Frei aber einsam, which means free but lonely. Now this was apparently Joachim's personal motto. From what I understand, uh, Joe was having not the easiest time with the ladies at that point, and uh, he had taken on this motto of free but lonely. Now, in the next piece you're going to hear, this, I have a point here. 
<laughs> this third sonata of Robert Schumann was, in fact, a result of this collaborative sonata. Schumann wrote the second and fourth movements for this collaborative sonata, and then realized he was halfway to a third violin sonata. He had not very long ago written his first two. So he wrote two more movements, completed the sonata, and the piece was highly regarded by Joachim, highly regarded by Clara, uh, Robert's wife, but unfortunately, very shortly thereafter, Robert had his final descent into mental illness from which he never recovered. And with the terrible stigma surrounding mental illness in those days, uh, there was a great fear that his later music was going to be tainted with this idea that it was the product of a sick mind. Uh, unfortunately, that meant that this third sonata was suppressed. It was suppressed for over a hundred years, and in fact, the world premiere of the piece happened on the hundredth anniversary of Schumann's death right here in the Wigmore Hall. Uh, and one last thing I will say is that the second movement of this sonata that comes from the FAE sonata, Andy, can you just play FAE? Listen out for that. <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. We think the piece is absolutely miraculous and wonderful and hope that the next hundred years that it becomes uh, a cornerstone of the repertoire.
James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong there with Schumann's third violin sonata. Music that divides opinion as to whether it does or doesn't reflect the impairment of the composer's mind. Though hearing that performance, it sounded perfectly convincing to me. And the Wigmore Hall audience seemed happy enough with it. As James Ennis said just now, there was no publication until the centenary of Schumann's death in 1956, when it was reassembled from what by then only survived as sketches. Luckily, they were almost complete. And when Stephen Isselius made his cello adaptation, he found there was only one bar missing, though its absence stood out like a gap tooth. So not messing around with minor talents, he got the composer Thomas Adders to do the dentistry and fill it in. are depicted. In fact, he couldn't be less helpful because although he was a composer given to evocative titles, the ones he provides here are just tempo indications. Not fast, lively, quick, slow. Nothing to capture the imagination of a child at bedtime. But scholars rifling through Schumann's journals have suggested he was thinking of Rapunzel in the first two then Rumpelstiltskin, and then Sleeping Beauty. And that's entirely possible. What we certainly know is that the piece was written in 1851 for the leader of the orchestra Schumann conducted in Dusseldorf, and it was primarily intended to be played on the viola. So for this one piece, James Eddies is upsizing to that instrument. Something he does quite often, so he knows where he to put his fingers. And here he is with Andrew Armstrong to play Schumann's Märchenbilder. Thank you. 
Schumann's enigmatic set of fairy tale pictures, Märchenbilder, played there by James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong. I only wish I could say Schumann lived happily ever after. It was not to be, but he did evidently expect to live on in the music of Brahms, because he said so. He thought of Brahms as his protégé, who would keep alive the spirit of romanticism as Schumann perceived it. That wasn't to be either. Brahms went his own way. But he was nonetheless marked for life by his youthful encounter with Schumann, and no less with Clara Schumann, who became an object of lifelong devotion. We'll never know exactly what happened between Brahms and Clara, but something did. And three decades after their initial encounter, she was still in his mind when he wrote his last violin sonata, number three in D minor. On completing it in 1888, he wrote to Clara saying he imagined the piano part flowing gently through her fingers. Though that's something else that didn't happen, because 30 years on, she was an ageing woman with a neuralgic condition that affected her hands, so she was unable to play. There are four movements in the piece, starting with an allegro that has a classic Brahmsian feature of a sustained pedal point in the piano part. It underpins the entirety of the development section. Then there's an adagio, like a slow waltz, with a focus very much on the violin. The third movement reverses that, switching the focus to the piano. And the finale comes in a galloping 6-8, heavy and dark. I've seen it described in commentaries as grimly passionate, and it seems to me that's a fair observation. On stage now to play Brahms' third and final violin sonata in D minor, James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong.
James Ennis and Andrew Armstrong there receiving warm applause for an impressively assured performance of Brahms' violin sonata number three in D minor. I suggested grimly passionate was a good description of that music, and it is. But you might also hear it as an example of suppressed passion, loaded with memories of things that might have been. I suspect Clara heard it on similar terms. She wrote to Brahms saying that the third movement reminded her of a beautiful girl exchanging pleasantries with a young man. And then suddenly, in the middle of it all, becoming overwhelmed by deeper emotion. Make of that what you will. Well, I think there's going to be an encore. Yes, there is. We're going to play another piece by Brahms. This is his fifth Hungarian dance. And remember how I said there was going to be a test? <laughs> Which violinist do you think arranged this Hungarian dance? Joseph Joachim, yes. Well, still caught in tonight's web of interconnections, that, as you heard James say, was Brahms' Hungarian Dance No. 5, arranged by Josef Joachim. It brings to an end this recital, exploring the relationship between Brahms and Schumann, a relationship to which James Ennis returns later in the season here at Wigmore Hall, so watch this space. Yeah.
here they come again. This may take some time. As you do watch this space, can I ask you please to give some thought to the costs involved in bringing you these online concerts? A donation to the hall would be enormously appreciated, as would ongoing support by joining the Friends scheme. You can never have too many friends. From me, Michael White, goodbye.